So many of you are familiar with the term quiet quitting, but are you familiar with the term silent erasure? It, as the name suggests, refers to a practice of slowly and intentionally decreasing the prominence of something and then the existence of that thing. You see, I was initially going to title this video, Women Run the Music Industry, because I feel like they do. But after doing just a little research, I found that the world's favorite girls are doing well, but the rest of the industry is not. Female artists in music have dominated this decade in growth, streaming, record and ticket sales, and critical acclaim. So why are we doing so well? Because we have to grow fast. We have to work this hard. We have to prove that we deserve this. And we have to top our last achievements. Women in music, on stage or behind the scenes, are not allowed to coast. But we need to keep advo advocating for women in the recording studios, behind the mixing board, in A&R meetings, because rather than fighting to be taken seriously in their field, these women are still struggling to even have a chance to be in the room. I am a songwriter, a Grammy-winning songwriter. I have been writing songs for 17 years. I've been in the music industry my entire adult life. And all I do is advocate for the compensation of songwriters. Almost all of my friends are in the music industry and write for your favorite artists like a Beyonce. Almost every artist that I have ever written for has gotten publishing on the record. Publishing is my only source of income. These songwriters have been out here. We've been in the street, literally. I have been in the street in front of Spotify. I've been in front of Universal. I have sat and I have talked to all y'all publishers. I talked to the DSPs. I talked to the copyright royalty, uh, the copyright, the US Copyright Office. I talked to NMPA. I talked to RIAA. I talked to Sona, I talked to NSAI, I talked to all of them, and guess what? Y'all are still broke! Pay attention to the women who are continually elevated in huge numbers and the huge number of women that are left behind. And don't be lazy and predictable and blame all of their failure on a few women's success. They are, after all, in their own way, feminists. Feminist. A person who believes in the social, political, and economic equality of the sexes. sexes. The sexist agenda of highlighting a few and erasing the plenty is institutional. Now let's discuss that. Whew. You know, from the spectacle of the 2020s decade, it's easy to believe that we're in a renaissance for women and femmes in music. Because in many ways, we are. There have been so many historic firsts up to this point, so many different types of bodies, colors, and gender performances are being highlighted, right? And 2024 is a huge year for women in music, and so a huge year for us, their fans. And as such, their images and likeness are dominating social media conversations. And in this year alone, we are expected to get all of the things, or have already received many of the things, depending on when you're watching this video, a Nicki Minaj tour. Taylor Swift is still on her critically acclaimed Eras tour and is about to drop her highly anticipated album, The Torture Poets Department. Ariana Grande just delivered her first conceptual album and uh, dare I say, maybe her best work, Eternal Sunshine. Beyonce, Acto, Acto, the country album, Howdy, is on the way. We have new Lana Del Rey, Megan Thee Stallion, Cardi B, and if pigs fly, Normani will be dropping some, Normani, Normani will be dropping something this year. And that isn't even half the list. The girls keep us talking. They remain in musical conversation and remain an integral part of the musical zeitgeist, generating billions of dollars of media value impact despite only making up one third of the music industry. But it's important to peel back the Barbie pink veneer of progress to really uncover the truth of this industry, right? Hi, Barbie. <laughs> the truth is, it's ran by the man, but the women keep the tempo. Okay, seriously. And all the while, women who just signed up to be artists are having to be activists, artivists. So is this really a renaissance for women in music? If the music industry is growing increasingly more broke and more greedy, what do women and femmes need from us to feel seen and supported and empowered? And how are they responsible for creating some of the most visually and audibly stimulating and culturally influential art on the planet and being paid and played less while doing so? Girl, let's get into it. Yeah, hey, yo, whoa, whoa, boy, and homies, welcome and they're welcome back, back up, back up. <laughs> to my corner of the internet. If this is your first time ever seeing my face, my name is Herbie, Herbie Rivalis. My pronouns are he, she, him, hers, and hers. Is. And yes, that does mean that I wear pants, skirts, pearls, and purses. Happy Women's History Month! 
<laughs> Happy Women's History Month. Yes, that is correct. At the time of filming, it is Women's History Month. And I thought it was important for me to create a video that kind of celebrates and advocates for some, one facet of the contribution that women make to this world. And as a cultural critic and a lover of all things spectacle, I figured why not use these two things um, to infuse these worlds and have this conversation. Cultural critique and music, that is, those are the two things. Stay with me. I mean, they've always been inextricably linked. There is no Sunday dinner recipe, no dance break with your girlfriends, no passing down of culture, no moment worth living that isn't documented by the soundtrack of the song that you loved or the person in the room loved at that time, right? That isn't documented by the rhythm and blues of those moments. Let me tell you something. This is gonna be a wild ride because we are going to get into the magnificence of women in the music industry. And we're gonna talk about some of the advocacy that needs to happen so that we can get more of said magnificence but before we do that i think it's important to um talk about what set the stage for these women right and how certain barriers seem to be just as timeless as the incredible music listen in the words of beyonce circa 2011 men have been given the chance to rule the world but ladies our revolution has begun <laughs> I love that performance so bad. And honestly, in 2011, a 12 year old me actually was convinced that that revolution had begun. By the way, I do think that act two or act three will be called revolution or revelation, but more on that later. You know, my latest obsession is Tina Turner. <laughs> I found this Tina Turner magazine in the grocery store and I was like, I absolutely need it. The only thing in here is just all queen of everything, Tina. Without Tina, there wouldn't be many of the girls and boys that you see in the industry. And I, I listen to Private Dancer like it dropped last night. I'm obsessed with her. She is my, like I said, my latest obsession. But, and she's actually the catalyst for today's conversation because I recently watched her a most recent documentary prior to her passing on Max and it was a difficult watch. But what I took from it was the kind of silent resilience so many women have to have when navigating this industry um, and the conditions that make life difficult for women in public life, women in music, right, are universal sexist right sexism with spectacle oh and great hair never forget the dresses darling never forget but their experience in a way resonates with all women and femmes and that's not to say that as life becomes better or worse for our faves it'll become better or worse for the average woman right but it is to say that the music industry operates in a similar way that the real world operates, where success is hierarchical and patriarchal. And that frustrates the bleep out of me because why is art a part of your political scheme? <laughs> I mean, really, seriously, let's unpack why I can't just be a delusional baddie who is hearing girl boss anthems and being gaslit because they're gatekeeping the information about how to become a real girl boss. I don't wanna unpack all that, but I just wanna know why I can't do that in peace. But let me not get ahead of myself. As I was watching a 56 year old Tina Turner take control over her life for the first time ever, right? And command the largest audiences she would ever command, create some of the most influential and timeless music of her career, I was in awe because I understand the disposability complex for women in this society of a particular age, size, race, and look. Funny enough, Tina Turner did not think that she was conventionally attractive and I gag, I gag every time because to me, she is exceptionally beautiful exceptionally beautiful right just divine truly um but even if i accept the notion that she is not right the ideal butte which would be white thin and 22 goo goo gaga -ga, i'm just your baby i'm just your baby um <laughs> She was still able to amass so much success. And here's where the shift happens and where what brought me to this conversation, right? Because I'm like, look at the power of women at any point in their life, right? And women rule the world. Who runs the music industry? Girls. That would have been my simplistic take. Um, but as I, you know, I am a curious person by nature. I'm an Aquarius, so it's just kind of all a part of my magic. It got me to thinking, what did it mean for Tina Turner to become an icon of the face of all these odds. 
Was this evidence that the 80s was a turning point for women in music, right? Considering this divine black woman of a particular age was able to amass so much success? Or was this just a dog whistle to women everywhere, but particularly non-white women, right? That in order to survive and excel in this boys club, you must be extraordinary. We live in a man's world, but it would be nothing without a woman or a girl. Let me tell you something. Because of Tina Turner, I've gone on a deep dive and the 80s was home to all of the iconic girlies. Cher, Madonna, Whitney Houston, Aretha Franklin, Janet Jackson, Celine Dion, and well, yes, Tina Turner. <laughs> Well, guys, Tina Turner, honey. Let me tell you something. They broke records previously held by, you know, other female and male musicians. It was a time where we got culture shifting, seduction, soul, and, and, and glamour not yet seen to, up to that point. But despite all of that progress and spectacle and, and you know, all of that divinity, honey, divinity, um, the 80s was not a revolutionary time, right? Or not as revolutionary as a, a time for women in music as I think many people like to paint it. And the more I do the reading, the more I consume information about women and femmes experience in music, I'm like, I'm unsure if even right now, in the 2020s decade, if it is, if we've reached that point of that revolutionary shift, have we arrived? You know, several years back, Jay-Z went viral for saying America is much more sexist than they are racist to a young girl in his concert audience. At this very moment, America is way more sexist than they are racist. And I always found that to be incredibly provocative, obviously, but interesting. And not interesting because I'm ever interested in the oppression Olympics discourse because I find that conversation is incredibly, it causes more hurt and less understanding, right? And also because I ascribe to a intersectional feminist politic that reminds me <laughs> that these different forms of bigotry work together, right, to harm folk, not independently. But what is interesting about that and also relevant to today's topic is it got me to thinking about the history of these two, these two isms and sexism is much older than the construction of race and therefore racism. And so to me, that suggests that maybe sexism might be more, might has the potential to present itself in a much more nefarious and covert way, right? Something we, many things we may be blind to because that's just the way it is. That's just the way it's always been. And I'm bringing this up because when discussions are being had, at least in my corner of the internet, about, you know, the progression of music or just the status of music, right? And who is responsible for the the tone, setting the tone, um, you know, setting the standard, creating good work. Women are central to that conversation. Even as I'm scrolling down my personal um, DSP of choice, which would be Apple Music, um, and I'm looking at the different genres and the faces that they use to represent those genres. It looked pretty gender inclusive or by in a binary context, you know, man and woman. It looked pretty even. But then I realized, Herbie, you might be being blinded by tokenism. Because why is it always the same women and a, and a variety of men? The industry has allotted an incredibly small space to all kinds of women, even up until this very moment. And every single type of woman, so different races, different bodies, different genres, are all supposed to fit within this one little slice of the pie. And we can be ignorant to that because they do incredible work and they work their ass off. Of course, this, this one little slice is stratified in a white supremacist patriarchal way. So white, thin, blonde, bubblegum pop girls to the front. And then we will add everyone else in descending order. Now. Let me be, I, I love when conversations are rooted in data. So this portion of the conversation is definitely going to be statistic heavy. And I've collected this data from a variety of sources from the DSPs like Spotify themselves down to the United States, the <laughs> United States, United States Bureau of Labor Statistics. So I said this today, gentlemen, before you get your Fruit of Looms in a bunch, you can add your car, you can add your arguments to the comment section, yes, but you should try also adding it to the data set. In short, translation, 
read a book, read an article, read an Instagram caption all the way through, and then fight with me. Now listen, don't buck, cause if I knock, then we gonna have a problem. <laughs> then we gonna have a problem. Let's move on. Now, according to this study that I found using Spotify and iTunes data, the sad reality is men are more likely to stream male artists and women are more likely to stream in a gender equal or gender neutral, I guess, way. So women stream mostly women, well, 31%, and these are rough numbers, 31% of women stream mostly women, 34% of women stream mostly men, and 34% of women stream both equally. Whereas men, 47% of men stream mostly men. That's damn near half. Okay, the bromance is real. And only 18% of men stream mostly women. It's important to note here that there are so many important factors to an artist's career and their staying power than just Spotify and iTunes streaming numbers, right? There's Billboard, there is awards, right? Awards matter, there's sales. <laughs> Bring back sales. People don't buy albums anymore. They don't buy albums, okay? Even TikTok is a part of the conversation, child. But I did wanna highlight what I think can appear as an inherent bias or preference on the part of men to stream other men. But let's not be so quick to throw tomatoes at these businesses because everything is structural. And when we look at this on the surface, yes, it can appear that men have a prejudice or a preference for male artists. Or we can really peel back the layers, look at the data and see that there are studies that found that there is an algorithm and a system that disproportionately suggests male artists as opposed to women and other gendered artists. Yeah, now we're really unpacking the things. Okay, so there was a study done by the Association of Computing Machinery that found that streaming platforms like Spotify, Apple Music, sorry, and iHeartRadio, they may be giving male artists more airtime using algorithms that more like that are more likely to recommend male artists as opposed to female and mixed gendered artists. An analysis of over 330,000 streaming music listeners over a nine year period, y'all, showed that only 25% of songs played were led by by women. Their observation revealed that on average, the platform would start by spinning six tracks by men before choosing a female artist. You don't find that suspicious? You don't find that suspicious. And what I find even more suspicious are these legitimizing organizations like the Grammys and Billboard's half-ass attempts to convince us that they are working to create more equitable and equal working conditions and create a fair playing field. They are not. Not, not from what I can see, okay? They are not. I'm not seeing DEI. Okay, in the in the Grammys and Billboard in a real way, in a substantial way, right? Because here are some numbers. I don't know if you know this. Just 6.5% of the producers credited on Billboard last year or in 2024, 2023, were women. 6.5%. And before that, in 2019, right? Way back in 2019, it was just 4%. That huge 2% growth was from including women of color in the narrative. Uh-huh. And this women of color narrative, we've got to unpack that a little bit more a little bit later, but not when the Grammys, the big six categories, and that would be record of the year, album of the year, song of the year, best new artist, producer of the year, and songwriting, or excuse me, songwriter of the year. Not when women only made up 15% of the folks who were nominated in 2023. No, that's not DE and I. That's not inclusion, right? In 2023, 64, almost 60, 64.6, almost 65% of Billboard's Hot 100 year entry charts were men. 34% were women and 0.6% were gender non-binary folk. I'm not seeing the DE and I initiatives. Uh, girl, girl, well, well, don't throw tomatoes at me. Throw them at Billboard. In order for women to be successful, and this data is aggregated data for over 10 years, right? Dating back from 2012, all the way through today. Women artists are most likely to be successful at 34.4, or excuse me, 34.7% um, in pop, which is gatekeeped by race, size, and beauty, right? They're least likely to be successful in alternative at 14.4% and hip hop at 14.9%. Um, 
which are also gatekeeped by toxic masculinity. It's just giving very much you don't want women to succeed. And it what is perplexing me about these numbers is the fact that I see women everywhere. It feels like women are dominating. But the numbers, women lie, men lie, propaganda can convince you of anything. Numbers! Numbers do not. But see, that's not what Billboard would like you to focus on. Billboard would like you to focus on the fact that 64, is it, or excuse me, 61% of the artists on the Hot 100 year-end charts were people of color. And only 39% were white. But when we look at that 61% and we say that that constitutes every single human being who's non-white, you realize that, of course, white people and white men specifically are still dominating the charts. You, you know, they can never make me hate you, but Billboard, I'm on your ass. <laughs> I'm on your ass. Now, listen, these are numbers that I pulled from online. If anything can be disproven, you know, this was on, a lot of this was on Billboard's, this is on Billboard's website. You can find this information on Billboard. They've publicized this happily. My God to damn, wait, is this even important? Okay, I do want to get into why this matters, right? Because I'm sure there are people in the comments like, we should be talking about women and females in a variety of contexts, contexts much more important than, you know, music. Let's talk about women in politics. And uh, girl, I'm here for it. I absolutely am here for it. As a matter of fact, Beyonce for president. <laughs> no! Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> I live for that. <sighs> I can't wait for Beyonce to run for Popis. She's got to win, you know. <laughs> but music is important and you guys know i love taking frivolity or what people consider to be frivolous pop culture element and finding the cultural significance um and the interpersonal significance that it holds with us right because music is a core tenant for relationship building don't believe me? you know i have the data to back it up there was a study done that tried to examine the topics that that people find most important when relationship building and so across different relational contexts whether that is short term long term friendships what have you and among the top five were political views, food preferences, career goals, travel desires, and yes, music preferences. And you know, I'm gonna say something. I do find that to be true. Me and my ex had to break up because we got into very heated, very nasty, very violent, never physical, but definitely violent, emotionally violent um, conversations, <laughs> debates, because he was a diehard lamb and I was a die, and still am a diehard beehiver. And we could never have constructive conversations about both those ladies' success. It always descended into gutter butt conversations. Great. We always went down in the gutter. I mean, that's why I had to break up with him. That and the fact that he cheated. But just between you and me, the Beyonce slander was the bigger offense. I've got to be honest. I've got to be honest. Music has immense power to change hearts and minds and to build relationships, obviously. There's a level of humanity in it, right? Um, as long as, well, you know, as long as we as humans keep making it, right? And that's another conversation with AI and, you know, making people sing whatever you want them to. It's kind of interesting because Patrick Starr stays on my For You page <laughs> singing I Care by Beyonce. I mean, and it, I live. I live. Um, but it's dangerous, right? Um, and pretty soon, we're not going to be having a gender debate. We're going to be having a humanity conversation, which should be the conversation we're having right now, right? Women's rights in this space and in every other context are human's rights. Um, women's access should be basic human's access. Make the shit fair, okay? Now, it is important to note that women and men listen to music about the same, right? So there's no, it's not something that we can't turn around is a point that I'm making. Women and men, according to Spotify, on av their average listener consumed 26,637 minutes of content on that platform. However, you know, men did outpace women by about 3,000 minutes. It's not really on a consumer basis. It is this way because everything and everywhere we consume music is owned by white males we've just got to be honest about it nothing in particular against white males my favorite barista at my local coffee shop makes the best matcha nobody makes it nobody do body like he do nobody makes matcha like he does shout out to Tim. but it becomes an issue when your identity creates blind spots or worse creates the opportunity for you to intentionally ignore an oust 
others. And it becomes even more nefarious when they create AI and organizations that legitimize folks' music and career with, with these same biases in their process, in their consideration process. So let's play a game called Guess Who? I'm going to name a powerful music institution and you're gonna guess the name of the person who owns it. It's fun, okay? You'll give yourself a score, X out of five, and comment what your score is in the comments, okay? I'm the owner of Spotify. Right, Daniel Eck, a white man. The owner of Apple Music? Ooh, this one is a kind of tough one. Tim Cook, we'll go Tim Cook, kind of, sort of. It's really confusing when businesses get that big because it's like, well, who does own it? But you know, white man. The owner of Pandora, the streaming giant and Pitchfork, one of the most influential music publications. Huh? Roger Lynch. Roger Lynch, yes, Lynch, a white man. Okay, four, the owner of Universal Music Group, UMG. Now, just so we're clear, UMG is the most profitable record label on the planet. This is a tough one because it's super huge, kind of like Apple. So it's kind of divided up in shares. The company with the largest share is something called Tencent, which is owned by Ma Huatang, Hu an Asian man, man nonetheless. And lastly, the owner of Tidal. Yes, wrong, actually. You're wrong. It's not Jay-Z. It's actually Jack Dorsey, mm -hmm. the old owner and well, former owner of Twitter. Interesting, right? This list is, you know, honestly, I'm not, I would say this is surprising, but no, it looks about white. <laughs> it looks about white. Either way, again, very exclusive list. Boys Club, we don't live. We really don't live. It's giving very much He-Man, Woman, Hater, and I hate that for us. Um, and honestly, it's not representative of the public's interests, right? Or the public's taste. And as such, it makes you question, what can we do to reshape the industry to create more space for these incredible women to shine like they do? All right, let's wrap this up. These are my closing thoughts. Now, as we bring this to a close, I do want to first shout out um, all of the incredible women, women-led organizations, or just organizations for women in the music industry, uh, music industry advocating for women and femmes. And that would be She Is The Music, Spotify Equal, Moving The Needle, Women's Audio Mission, Be The Change, Key Change, Girls Make Beats, and so many more. And also a big shout out to Tiffany Red, who has been igniting conversation about women um, and songwriters in general, right? But it really has sparked a conversation about women in that behind the scenes of the music industry, not just in songwriting, right? Music production, engineering, all that shit. Um, so shout out to you. I've said it before, I'll say it again, and I'll continue to say it. Women create some of the most interesting universes with their music, right? Um, and tell some of the most compelling stories. Something about the divine feminine energy. I mean, I don't know. I would, I would argue that the two most interesting artists, and the way I'm defining interesting is the artists who generate the most public interest on the planet are women. Beyonce and Taylor Swift. Uh, Adele is definitely, definitely arguable. We should add Adele. We should add Adele. But Adele just comes in and out of the world. She disappears. She comes here. She goes back to Mars where she's from. I don't know. But, you know. Beyonce and Taylor Swift. But it's important that I echo what Taylor Swift said at the top of this video or the clip that I included at the top of this video. These women are creating incredible work because they love it. Yes, of course, right? And because they're just great at it. But also because of the structural conditions that remind them that they have to work twice as hard. And if you're a woman of color, three times as hard. If you're a woman of color who's queer and a bigger body, you know, it just goes on and on and on. It is a must. It is a requirement that they be great if they want to have a sustained career, right? And great at everything. Even the things that it's like, mm, I didn't really sign up to be a dancer. Well, dance. You must be a triple threat. You must be a skinny legend, the queen of your respective genre. You have to be, you have to be the spectacle at all times. Because if not, you'll fade and you'll be replaced within a very small margin like I mentioned earlier. Everyone is replaceable, um, particularly women of color. It's almost like when they cast a black person or a brown person, Asian person in a show um, and they just, the next season, change the actor and we're like, we we know, we know that's not the same per, we know that's not the same person. But they do view certain classes of people in margins as replaceable. And I think that that's the experience for so many women, you know? And this issue, like I said, compounds on itself at the intersection of race, body size. There's a reason why there's only one Lizzo in this industry. 
and you know previously one Adele there's still only what a gel honey but you get what i'm saying my final final thoughts are we just gotta stream women girl ladies gays and days we must stream the women more we must choose to stream a diverse set of women i'm gonna put in the description box the women that i'm streaming right now many of whom are mainstream some of whom you may not have heard of you know, add them to your set list. Um, and, you know, shout out to women for being incredible. Shout out to Tina Turner <laughs> um, for planning this idea in my head because I was initially going to do a video entitled Women Run Music and just expound on why women are the only reason why music is interesting right now. Um, and really the reason why music has been interesting for a very long time. But that would have not been that would have not been of service to folks who are advocating for more space. And so that's what I wanted this to be. I love you too, too bad. Before I let you go, you know, I would never leave you without saying this. I am in a constant state of practice. And so are you. You can never fail when you're in a constant state of practice. I love you. Bye, whole world. I got to get up out of here, girl.